science. We get experimental get science. We're curious, non judgmental. All right, let me go ahead and send an invite to our friend, Lola the Scientist. All righty, invite has been sent. And uh, we'll be waiting for her to connect. Uh, we're going to do a quick rant intro with her, you know, who she is, where she's doing her sciences. Afterwards, uh, we'll start getting into some questions that I have and questions that y'all have as well. So if you have questions about mosquito research, the importance of mosquito research, um, what Lola works on, and everything in between, please have those questions ready. She is a gem and is TikTok famous as well. She's got an awesome SciComm TikTok, TikTok page. Uh, that we'll be linking y'all to as well. All right, Jet, let me go ahead and add Lola to the call. There she is. Hello, Lola. Together, we can rule the galaxy. Oh, Blembly, thank you for the subscription very much. Uh, Lola, you come on and we already have a new Blembly subscriber. Just subscribe well, for four you months. know what, that's just great. Get can that can everyone hear me okay? Baby. I've never done anything like this. So Your audio know. is great. Perfect. And Blembly, thank you for the tier one gifted to their pot of raw science. Thank you very much, Blembly. For that support it is the power of lola uh, little low i'll put boost the volume with just a tad all right lola can you give us a test test hello all right should, should be better i've bumped up your volume i can i can yell too i'm pretty good i'm like using my inside voice i can use my outside voice if i need to i i think that would be awesome primarily right. primarily because we love <laughs> As chat will tell you, we love our outside voices here. Um, there, you know, we we like to get a little, little loosey goosey, but it's um it's a pleasure to have you on. Thank you so much for yeah, coming on with us today. Me. Um, we're we're really excited to talk mosquito genetics with you today. Um, I just wanted to highlight to everyone how cool it was on your TikTok that you do science outreach on your TikTok page. Um, and that's yeah, actually. I tried. Yeah, that's how we found Lola, y'all, was uh, was on TikTok, and she was so kind to agree to come on the stream with us and chat about science, and so we're going to plug your TikTok throughout the stream, and anything else that you want us to look at, of course, we'll be showing it off. Um, but to get started, I was wondering if you could tell us a little bit about you, your current research, as much as you can tell us about where you are without doxing yourself, of course, be safe, yeah. <laughs> um, and then we'll be getting into some, like, Cool Together, images. Risto, hi. Risto is also coming in with a resub at tier two. Hello, Risto Rock eighty eight. Risto Rock eighty eight just subscribed for twenty five months. Hi, hello, sir. Yeah, hi, hello to you too, Risto. T TTS does not want to participate. Risto, thank you for the two tier two resub, adding two pieces of raw science to the beaker for the month. Thank you, Risto. Welcome in, Risto. We have Lola the scientist here with us. She is just about to get us answer us about some of the work that she does. Uh, I did want to apologize to y'all. We had samples on the way, and then the U.S. government decided to take a holiday. I didn't get off. Lola, did yeah. you get off today? Um, I took off today. <laughs> didn't do anything today. <laughs> I So I gave myself off today. See, that's a well-balanced scientist. I appreciate that. I, you, we were, we've been told when I was in, in, uh, in grad school, like, we're like, oh, hey, it's a holiday. And, they're, and our boss is like, oh, yeah, I'll see you tomorrow. <laughs> like, uh, yep, yep, yep. I had to work today. I'm glad you took today off. That's a really nice sign that you get to take have some work-life balance. Yeah, for sure. I, the staff was taking off, so I was like, well, um, I don't need to be there either. It's fine. I'll pick <laughs> back up on Tuesday. <laughs> nice. Excellent. Uh, but, chat, we did – Lola was so kind to send us some samples and – they did not arrive on Saturday, and so I couldn't go get them today. But we have images to look at. Um, Lola sent us a bunch of really cool things, and we're going to start chatting about the mosquito genetics that we'll be able to look at um, with the images behind us. Uh, so with that, Lola, please kick us off. Tell us a little bit about who you are, what you do, and some yeah. mosquitoes. Absolutely. Um, See, so yeah, I'm a PhD candidate. Um, I'm trying not to dox myself in a big city. <laughs> um studying mosquitoes i my project kind of jumped to a lot of different places during my time in this program i'm currently a fourth year uh i'll be a fifth year later on this year which is absolutely just wild um i started off studying um 
these like two unknown genes that were expressed in the mosquito ovary and no one had any clue why they were there or what they did. They just had really, really crazy changes in dynamics depending on the reproductive state. We still don't really know what they do. Um, but that's actually what some of these images are. Um, I then moved on to developing a project where I was exploring the relationship between the brain and the reproductive system. Because if you don't know, mosquitoes only bite you when they're not pregnant. So I was really interested in how does the brain know that they're pregnant? Um, or how does the reproductive system know when a mosquito is trying to hunt for something? So I was kind of interested in how, whether it's like circulating factors in hemolymph, which is like our blood, or if it's actual direct neural communication. Um, I was curious as to like what was, I guess, that mainstream of communication. Couldn't figure that out. So now I'm currently um, trying to map the reproductive nervous system. So the reproductive system of mosquitoes has a lot of neurons that are associated with it. Um, some that come in from other parts of the body and some that are just held within the system themselves. So I'm currently trying to map that. It's kind of in the early stages, but I've gotten some pretty cool images so far. Um, but yeah, so I did not expect to start studying you know, mosquitoes when I started in grad school. I have a neuroscience degree from undergrad and I did the typical mouse, nematode kind of stuff. Um, but I really liked the lab when I started off here. And I was like, okay, well, I think I could learn to love a mosquito in a way that you can love a mosquito. Um, so yeah, I currently am dissecting all the time, taking really pretty pictures. Um, yeah, that's kind of a bit about my journey. I also make TikToks for fun. Um, there's not a lot of black women that are out there kind of being represented in the science in the sciences. And so I've tried to make my TikTok a fun space where people can see that anyone can be a scientist. And honestly, we all already are just by asking questions and being curious about our natural world. So that's a little bit about me. I, I love that, Lola. The the mantra of why you have the TikTok too, that anyone can be a scientist. Cause I think it's, it's one thing that we really try to encourage here as well, that it's not limited to degree, right? It's more of just like how, how you're thinking about things in the natural world and being curious uh, because there's so, I would argue there's so many scientists too that have lost that curiosity and then they're not even, if they're really scientists anymore, are they, are they just like, you know, a grant writing machine at that point, right? Yeah. So, mosquitoes you went into grad school not want not thinking that you'd work with them what what got you sold on a mosquito yeah so one i didn't know that mosquito research even existed at all um what sold me was i like i mentioned the lab environment itself was really great people were really excited about what they were doing and I also really liked the fact that I didn't feel like I was going to have to fight with everybody else in the world to ask a question about something. When I was studying mice, it was like, I was so scared about, you know, getting scooped. I was so scared about asking a question that like 12 other people were probably asking at the same time. And so I really liked what I, I don't know, what I feel was like a mental freedom in asking questions about mosquitoes. Uh, there's similar questions that are being asked in a bunch of other organisms, but there's something so special about a mosquito. It's the deadliest creature on the planet, like to, to humans, kills over 700,000 people a year. And so no matter what kind of work is being done in this animal, it is ultimately going to be impactful on human lives. Um, so I really was inspired by that mostly. Um, it felt like Anytime someone asked me why mosquitoes, I was like, well, didn't you get bit like last week? We all we all have to deal with this creature. Some people have to deal with this creature in more dangerous situations, but it's something that we all will experience unless you live in Iceland. Um, Are they not on Iceland? They don't, from what I understand, they don't have any. However, with like climate change and things like that, the range of the mosquito is spreading. I was recently in Iceland and they have a ton of like black midges, which mm -hmm. look similar to mosquitoes, but are not mosquitoes. Same, very, very close, like genetically, but they're not the same things. But I think that's primarily what they have up there. Um, but yeah, it's mostly about climate. They can't, it's too extreme of a climate up there that 
like they can't thrive. It doesn't get hot either. So it's Got not it. very yep. attractive. That's the, the benefit of where we are now, right? In the winter, there's just no, no mosquitoes. And then it really kicks on during the summer. And then at least yeah. they, they fade away again in the winter. Yeah, I don't, I just read an article that there, I don't remember where it was, someplace in the U.S. I think it was close, like more on the West Coast. Um, they're starting to see mosquitoes a little bit earlier now. Um, I mean, where I am on the East Coast, the snow is, we, we're barely getting snow anyways, but it's melting pretty fast. And mm -hmm. so all you need is one mosquito that is like, you know what, I'm feeling pretty good today. I'm going <laughs> to, I'm going to lay my eggs out here and see what happens. So I don't know. The weather changing really does throw off so many dynamics of mosquitoes. There are places all over the world that have never seen them before um, and are now getting them. Wow, or so that's going to be a huge effect on those locations. Yeah. Is there is there any way even to prepare a part of the world like like for something like that? I mean, I think in the same way that we are prepared here, like we know they're going to show up. They tell you to do the common things. If you have like standing water anywhere, try to get rid of it. I think there's only so much we can do at this current point with our understanding of mosquitoes. Mm -hmm. um, and so there's a lot of local efforts that are trying to like prepare communities for that. There's also a lot of like, I don't know, genetic mo genetically modified mosquitoes that are being released in certain populations, mostly tropical ones. Um, if you don't know, I also really, really love birds. So I like to stay up to date on bird things as well. But in Hawaii, I think of like the 72 endemic bird species there, like half of them exist now. Half of, half of them have gone extinct um, and they're going extinct pretty frequently. I think in the past like month, two different species, um, I think they went extinct. Wow. And it turns out the biggest cause right now of bird death in Hawaii is avian malaria. Hawaii did not have mosquitoes until a certain point. They have them now and they have so many that they're killing the birds. And so recently in Maui, this judge ruled, cause this has to go through like all sorts of environmental um, agencies and things like that. They have just ruled to release these mosquitoes, these males that basically are releasing incompatible sperm. So if a female mates with them, they can't, lay any eggs or they can't lay eggs that will hatch so there's so many different like preparation is kind of hard i feel like it's honestly more of a reaction more than like a preparation kind of situation um because you never know how it's going to impact the biodiversity of an area you never right. know <laughs> yeah well because it's like if you the idea of if you take out all mosquitoes on the planet you know there's about a thousand species right and so many of them are pollinators and not blood suckers, right? So that would be bad. But then if you take out the, even the the bad ones, will they replace like in the food chain? What's going to replace them and make sure that other animals get stuff to eat? So it's a it's a complicated yeah. question. Never seems like something straightforward. Where right? if I can just snap my fingers and they'd all be gone, it feels like yeah. there could be ramifications of it. Yeah, things that we don't even think about. Like, I always get this question of like, why are we like, are you trying to get rid of all mosquitoes? And I'm like, honestly, no, because I don't, I don't want to deal with whatever that brings on to the world. Um, but yeah, this is why mosquitoes are so exciting. There's so many different things we don't know about them and so many different you know, implications that they have on different parts of the world. And as they enter new environments, there's new questions that are going to be formed. So I just really, really enjoy studying something that has you know so many unknowns it's i mean what you were telling us too it just seems like almost fundamental knowledge right of how something as quote simple as an insect could have a communication between the brain and the ovary and it's like we don't know like you were saying and there's like so many things that you think that of base biology of it not even in the disease state that we would know about the animal and it's just so so little that we know about it so first of all Lola, yeah. thank you for studying it but also i think it comments to why we need researchers like you on the field yeah you know my lab i i think there's only one person who studies diseased mosquitoes our lab like doesn't even have the facility for that he has to fly to paris um oh, wow. to, like, mosquitoes because we have like a collaboration but the rest of us all study like non-infected mosquitoes we are really trying to ask the question of at baseline without any sort of disease any sort of infection that can be passed on how does this thing behave 
Um, and the question that this guy who's studying infected mosquitoes is asking, like, how does the behavior change once they're infected? So in order to even figure out what questions to ask there, we need to understand without any sort of modifications, how does a mosquito behave? How is it thinking? And how does it hunt? Who does it want? And why does it want them? You know, there's all these different layers that we don't even think about because it's an annoying bug. They, they bite us. Some people, they get, you know, infected by them. That's kind of all we really know. So I don't know, I really enjoy helping people think about mosquitoes as a way more complex creature than they've been fed to us as. Um, so yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And actually just getting on the, the basics of it, what does a mosquito research facility look like? And also, I have to ask you this question because I interviewed for some mosquito labs and I was told that to feed them, I'd have to stick my arm into a nest. How do yeah. you feed a mosquito? How do you keep them alive when you were trying to kill them? Like, what is your, what does the inside of this laboratory look like? Right. Um, I'll answer the, what the lab looks like first, and then I'll jump into the blood feeding. Um, <laughs> that's, it's a longer answer than like people think. Um, basically our lab, it looks like your standard laboratory. I was expecting a lot more, um, you know, containment, yeah. um, but because we're not working with mosquitoes that are infected, we don't have to take, you know, as many biological safety, like precautions as labs that do study infected mosquitoes. Um, so, you know, we have our benches, it's fine. Um, we have a cold room where we knock out our mosquitoes. Um, so if you put them at certain temperatures, they'll be, they'll be alive, but they won't move. Um, so if we're doing dissections, we either put them on like a cup of ice or put them in the cold room. Um, so if your standard lab equipment everywhere, but then our special uh, room is like way at the end of the hall and it's a double door system. It has like a big thing, like the USDA um, like sign on the thing. That's like, okay, there's, there's bugs in here. Um, so it's like a double door. Uh, you have to go in, press a button and you go in and then you have like a little vestibule that just starts like pouring like air down on you like really really hard to make sure there's nothing on you um and also when you're leaving to make sure there's no mosquitoes on you they, they still, still get, get on you, you. <laughs> um and, and they, they still stay on, on. They're, they're pretty strong, strong. um and, and then, then you press, press another button, button and then you're in our what, what we call our procedure room, room. And, and this is kind of where we hatch our mosquitoes um if we're doing blood feeding we usually do it in this room um like this is where we rear our mosquitoes so like from egg papers to full-blown adults, adults everything kind of happens in this space uh, we don't do we really don't do any of that outside of this room just because this is the regulated room um, and then in there we have a tropical room or at least a room with tropical like conditions so it's really hot and it's really humid um, and that's kind of where the mosquitoes live so we'll do whatever work we need to do outside in the procedure room and then they stay in um, that tropical room uh, mosquitoes buzzing in your ear the most just, yeah um it's really they're very loud actually if you get <laughs> if you get enough mosquitoes in a box and just sit next to it it like sounds just like it sounds like someone's holding up a fan to you it's very jarring Ooh. um and like kind of gross but it's okay i actually posted a tiktok where i accidentally forgot to remove some of the audio and someone commented i'm sorry is that them yelling at you? And I was like, oh my God, wait, you're totally right. You can't hear it. I had music on over it. I was talking over it, but you could still hear how loud this cage was. It was pretty, mosquitoes in a box sounds like a horror film. Yeah, it is. I'm how, working on it actually. That's my many, other side hustle. How many would you say were in one of those boxes in terms of so like to like get that kind of volume? Like how many was like a thousand? Yeah, we typically rear like, yeah. Once they hit the pupil stage, we like to make sure there's about a thousand mm -hmm. in each cage because um, it's not too crowded. Um, and if you need a bunch of mosquitoes, you have them. Um, but yeah, like some people put an absurd amount of mosquitoes in their cages and I'm like, this can't, this is not okay. I, I should have sent some pictures of that. Not um, naively asking, what is an absurd amount? Like what, what is like when you see it, what is too much? Um, so one thing about me, I can never eyeball anything. So like, <laughs> I can't tell you, but 
it's more than a thousand. It's like some people are not, some people don't do that little step where we get rid of the extra ones. They're just like, put them all in there. Um, okay, so we so hash out our egg papers and you don't really know how many you're going to get, but it's uh -huh. usually a lot of mosquitoes. And so we, once we hatch them from eggs, um, they go through a couple larval stages and then we do this thing called thinning, um, where we basically take the pan that we have and split it into a bunch of pans. So it's okay. not super crowded. So we can eyeball and kind of estimate how many we have, um, at that time, but like some people don't care. And it's like, instead of being like, okay, I need to count 400 per pan that I'm thinning into, they'll be like, I'm just going to split whatever's here in half. And you don't know how many that is. And then it's a lot of mosquitoes. But that is that is none of my business. But like, yeah, basically we have a tropical room and that's where we do all these fun things. Um, blood feeding. Let's talk about blood feeding. Yeah, um, yes. how, how, do we, how do we feed these suckers? Right. So before I answer, I'll give an anecdote. When I first started in the lab, I was asked, I, I asked my PI, I said, hey, do, if I want to be in this lab, do I have to stick my arm in a cage? Because that was a hard no for me. I don't get bit a lot, but when I do, it's so bad. Like it, the, it, I just huge welts and it's so uncomfortable. I was like, I don't want to have to do this. And she said, no, the only way you'd be allowed to stick your arm in a cage is if you go to the deans and tell them we are not forcing you. Um, and I was like, okay, well, I'm just not going to say anything because I'm not doing that. So some people stick their arms in the cages. Um, there's benefits to each one, which I'll get into this. The method I typically use is this metal puck apparatus. So basically we're taking like a metal dish that has like a little bit cut out and you put parafilm over that, heat everything up and you can basically pipette blood into it. And so the parafilm acts like a, like a basically like skin. And so the mosquitoes will be attracted to it we also like to rub it all over our skin so it smells like us. That's fun. Oh, um, that's incredible. <laughs> yeah. That's so clever. Um, I have a TikTok video about this, and it's literally just me just, like, everywhere. Um, but, yeah, so you put the parafilm on, put the blood in, and you put it on top of the cage, and the mosquitoes then will be attracted to it. What kind and of so blood? We use sheep blood. Okay. And it's, like, it doesn't coagulate or anything, so we can use it for a couple weeks oh wow uh, that's really cool yeah yeah um so they'll be happy they smell you they fly up to the thing and then they can like probe and then they can pierce the parafilm which they need to be they need to be able to pierce um in order to drink the blood um and yeah that's how they fill up and then there's like another method um that we use sometimes where this is mostly like if the staff wants to use that if they have to feed cages for us um, where you can just take a mouse, knock the mouse out, um, and put it in a cage. Mice do not get the same immune reaction that we do. So they're asleep and then they wake up and they're fine. They can just kind of go about their day. <laughs> that uh, must be nice, yeah. right? Yeah. Um, so yeah, we have like a few mice that we take really, really good care of because those are the only ones we have. And we only use them for the purpose of um, blood feeding. But uh, the benefit to my method is well, I'll say the benefit to the, the mouse is if you don't care about when your mosquitoes are being fed, um, then you can have someone else do it for you. Um, for me, a lot of my early experiments were, do, I was doing a lot of time courses for egg laying. So I needed to know the second they were being fed, how like by the hour, how long it's been. Um, and so because of that, I had to have control over when I was blood feeding. So that's why I was typically doing the puck because if it wasn't a Tuesday or a Friday, like I, I just had to do it myself mm -hmm. and I had to plan my experiments around what worked for me. Um, yeah, but some people do stick their arm, they're, you know, like another way to control for whatever you want <laughs> is just to stick your arm in. I just don't, I won't do it. I'm good. So I think a, a question from chat that has already arisen is kind of, you, you know, you're saying you're like kind of rubbing the puck on you as well to get that odor. What are what are the some of the components that attract mosquitoes to you? So like presumably like you were saying maybe odor, but is there a way to make it so they're not attracted to my smell? Or like what are the things that they attracted to that kind of you have to account for in the lab in addition to just in the outside world? Right. Um well 
it's interesting we try not to clean with heavily scented things um whenever we're cleaning the space because we don't want to mess with any sort of any sort of their odor processing um we had someone in the lab who was studying skin components um they are now at some biotech company doing other things making a lot of money studying skin microbiomes um but based on their work and the work of other people it's really the carboxylic acids in our skin and so basically stinky things so they love people after they're done working out um they love when it's been a hot summer day and everyone's outside because you've been sweating and i think what it boils down to is lactic acid anything that releases that it'll react to whatever bacteria we have on our skin mm -hmm. and it makes at least to a mosquito a stinky cheesy kind of smelly feet smell um, this is also why they bite our ankles a lot one you know the skin's exposed down there too it stinks um it stinks wow. more there than the rest of the body um yeah so i you know i think there's still so much that people are trying to understand about the combination of smells um that really attract mosquitoes but it's also been um studied kind of i, I think it's more like preliminary um there's a lot of components on our skin that are actually repellents. Um, and so it really is our unique, you know, combination of whatever's on our skin. And it's so hard to standardize that. We had like, um, what's it called? We had like a, a gradient in the lab of like the most attractive to the least attractive person. Um, and the thing that differed the most was the level of carboxylic acids that were found in the odor that came from the skin. Um, but there's still so many different components that like attract a mosquito. They like, I don't think they like super clean or like artificially flowery smells. Mm -hmm. Um, they do like naturally flowery smells because mosquitoes feed off of flowers anyways. Um, but that's, that's not really like related to host seeking specifically, but those are just some things that they're attracted to. Yeah, it's, I, we read papers as well about like even color sometimes, like what clothing color you're wearing can also be an additional attractant on top of that. So it's like there's a lot of it's out of your control, but then there is, does seem like there's a few things that you can maybe account for. Like you were saying the flowery smells, like perfumes and maybe clothing. Yeah, yeah. I And with the color, it's super interesting. Um, it seems like there's evidence that the that colors that you're wearing can attract but it's the why that people still don't really know. And so mm -hmm. I think it's kind of fun figuring out all the pieces of the puzzle, but you have no clue what the puzzle actually looks like at the end. It's just like, all right, these pieces fit together, maybe, but we have no clue what the end result is going to be. Uh, yeah, yeah, that's kind of, of that's kind of mosquito work. work. I mean, like you were saying, it's still a huge mystery at this point, right? And then uh, with the feeding too, we had a question from chat. So like, if you're, you know, when you have to keep like really, really tight components and paying attention of how much they were being fed and when they were being fed, how often do they need to eat? How, like, how often do you have to feed them? Yeah, well, a mosquito does not need to drink blood at all to live. That is not a requirement for them to live. They do it for the sole purpose of making eggs. That is the only reason they bite. Um, so mosquitoes, like I have many cages where I just have them around and they will be they do it out of, they, yes, they do it out of spite, basically. <laughs> um, yeah, I have, a bunch of, I have a bunch of cages where I will not have touched them and they'll die, or go to mosquito heaven just fine. Like they don't need any blood. Um, but in terms of reproductive cycles, basically once they take in blood, it takes about three days for them to make their eggs, they lay their eggs, and then they can go back and bite someone else. Um, and that's how diseases are spread because the fact they can bite turn off their biting and then turn their biting back on um if they bite something with like malaria that second cycle whatever they bite is going to get malaria um so in my experience i've been able to feed mosquitoes or i've been able to have them undergo like three to four reproductive cycles during their life if you take really good care of them where i can have them you know blood feed, lay their eggs, blood feed again, and lay their eggs and blood feed and lay their eggs again. That's typically what we do if we need to uh, collect a lot of eggs, like if we do any sort of genetic modifications of them. 
um, and we need a bunch of that genotype, we'll just kind of blood feed the cage over and over and over again to get as many eggs as possible. Um, but as they get older, their output's not as good. Um, so yeah, so they don't need the blood to live, but um, if we're feeling kind, we'll give it to them a few times. So but, yeah. I think an interesting series of questions arise from that. How do mosquitoes that don't use blood meals, how are their eggs able to, you know, be fertilized and lay? Like, do we know even the difference between those two animals on that level? Yeah. So, oh, someone said that that's why only the females bite. Yeah, that is why only females bite. Males don't need to. Um, and so they actually use, like, male feeding patterns or like feeding behavior to kind of ask those questions in non-blood feeding mosquitoes. Um, I don't study non-blood feeding, feeding mosquitoes, so this is also kind of like a, a knowledge gap for me, but from what I understand um, is that there are some similarities with fruit flies and fruit flies just need to like eat. And so sometimes it's that cycle of just having access to food mm -hmm. uh, can help them develop their eggs. Um, but I don't know much detail beyond that. So maybe it's like the specificity for what kind of food trigger them to be able to like go either after blood or stay with something else. Yeah, perhaps. Yeah, that's uh, the oh, it's really fascinating to me about the ovaries and the difference in fruit flies as well. Because like, actually, could we? Do you mind if we pull up an ovary picture? No, let's do it. I can walk everyone through all the different parts. There's a lot going on. Perfect. Uh, so, why I get really excited about the ovary is because my work in fruit fly genetics was primarily on ovaries. And so when you're saying like how there is this like almost pulse of eggs, right? And then you have like a rest feed again, another pulse of eggs. Does that mean that we have stem cell populations in the ovaries similar to fruit flies that reproduce the eggs? Or is it just a total set number of eggs from the start of life that mature with four, four pulses? Like how does that work? So, um, I don't know if I can answer specifically about the stem cells. However, at every point in the reproductive cycle, there are always primary follicles that are ready okay. to make an egg. Um, and so like this video right here is a non blood fed mosquito. And oh, wow. so all these little, yeah. So basically this is like the baseline of what the mosquitoes ovary ovaries look like. And they have, you know, two sets. Uh, they have, yeah, two of them in the white or the area of the white that kind of has these blue dots in it. What we're looking at here are all of the, like what will become an egg. Um, and so we have there a bunch of cells that, you know, once the signal comes from the blood and once the proteins are all imported into these eggs, um, all of those little cells in there will start feeding the oocyte. In green, this little dot is what's called a vitellogenin receptor. Um, and vitellogenin is a huge part of insect reproduction. Um, and so basically, these are also things that are like not fully understood in the mosquito yet. Um, but when a blood meal comes in, there's interactions with the vitellogenin receptor that basically create the yolk protein that becomes an embryo. Okay. Um, and so what we could think about this like is that all these are kind of dormant eggs. They're not nothing has stimulated them to start growing yet um but they are ready to go once that blood meal is taken and so what we see here i'm trying to like look close um what we have in the red in the middle is basically this long tube that once the eggs are fully matured they'll start traveling down that tube down to the reproductive tract um and out of the body gotcha. and so basically i'm sorry so is it each one of these little circles here is gonna be an egg at some point. Like it is ready to go. Yeah. And once all these are depleted, is the mosquito done? Do we know? No, uh, or done, wait, done Done meaning what? Cause I what? answered the way that I was thinking of done, but what good, do you mean? Good point. Uh, as in like, there are no more eggs. Like in both ovaries, you have this kind of system of all these circles, right? And once all those are go down that tube and are laid, are they done with the eggs or there's the possibility of, are there more hidden somewhere? So uh, it depends actually. Um, I've dissected quite a few ovaries after eggs have been laid. 
Um, and there's evidence sometimes that if an egg doesn't get laid, the ovary will reabsorb it. Oh, wow. Uh, okay. Wow. Yeah. But this is like something that's not easy to catch. Um, and like you kind of need the right stain at the right time to see that it's being resorbed. And some mosquitoes will do this if like they've held onto their eggs for a long time and the there's just like an energetic cost difference. Like I might as well, instead of holding on to these, using all my energy to that, I'm gonna just reabsorb and try again. Um, but it's usually not like a whole, I, I mean, I can't answer this because I haven't seen this, but I've never seen like a whole clutch of eggs being resorbed. Right. Also, you just wouldn't know because you just have an ovary that looks like this. Mm -hmm. Um, but yeah, it's like a very interesting and dynamic system, which is also why I was really attracted to working, um, working on mosquito reproduction, um, because it's like the entire system is just ready to go and all it takes is blood. It's remarkable how, like, I didn't realize this is what the internal anatomy looked like, that it's just like you said, on that ready to go front, all these eggs are good to go. They just need to be to get that blood meal to essentially activate that development, right? And then they go down yep. the the follicle, the ovarian tubes and then are laid. And that's really remarkable. Um, we already have some yeah. more questions from the chat. Um, are these laid in water? So I guess like, how would you simulate that in the lab? And then does each mosquito lay a certain amount and then die or do they just continually make eggs? Yeah, okay. So the water question. Mosquitoes do lay their eggs in water. Depending on the species, they do it differently. There's some that create these egg rafts on top of water. Um, I study Aedes aegypti, which is the yellow fever mosquito. And what these do is they try to find water and they'll tap it with their feet because that's also how they taste um, with their feet. Um, and then they will lay on the surface next to it. And so what this does is allows the eggs to dry out and then you can imagine this in like, I don't know, for example, let's say here, I have like, I have like this empty planter right here. Um, if there was a little bit of water at the bottom, um, I, a mosquito could come in and lay right on the edge of that water um, and say this fully evaporates. But if I pour more water into it after a few days, then the eggs will rehydrate and hatch. And so oh, they wow. basically... Yeah, so that's why they're kind of attracted to water, too, is to make sure there's a place where the eggs could be hatched, because they are hatched in water. They are laid in water and hatched in water. And mosquitoes will spend the first few phases of their life, like the first five days of their life in water. So, um, so do we know how resilient or how long the eggs can be resilient without water? Like, is that something where, you know, they could be dehydrated for a month and then you just sprinkle on some water in their back or is it is there like a much more narrow window of time it depends on the species Aedes aegypti very very resilient wow, um okay. yeah so in the lab we typically if we've collected a bunch of eggs it's like okay by month six you should hatch them just so like we can redo the cycle you don't want to lose them because at a certain point like maybe six or seven, eight months. I don't think I've ever pushed it that long. You'll get a lot less, you know, you'll get a lower hatch rate. So you're, you're uh, saying by six months of collecting the eggs, it's like, that's, that's, well, that statement is wild to me. Like, yeah, that is so cool about like, what, oh, that's insane of how resilient these little eggs are. Yeah. And um, it seems like there's certain genes that are kind of, you know, helpful in maintaining how long they can last. Um, so in areas where there's drought, where rainwater is like not consistent or it's just very spread out, mosquitoes are still able to thrive because they've kind of developed these adaptations that allow them to lay eggs that will last a really long time. So they're, they really do try to live. Like, it's really crazy. I've never seen a creature so motivated to survive. I mean, minus, I, I guess humans, but like, <laughs> it, it's crazy. Like, they, they last so long. Um, and even when you push the sixth, seventh months in the lab, like, I'll still at least get two. And like, all you need is two to get like a million at some point, honestly. Wow. Is there... Yeah. So uh, sorry about all the naive questions coming in, but I just like, no, these are so great. cool. 
Um, is there, is this kind of how they survive winter? Is our, our suspicion? Yeah, so, you know, it's interesting. I honestly have never thought about, like, how they survive winter like that. I've seen some recent, like, news pieces that were suggesting that they kind of, that adults go dormant. I don't know much about that. Um, eggs, it's also dicey because the way we get rid of eggs in the lab is by freezing them. We put uh. them in really cold temperatures and they don't hatch. But we have um, like a weird little side project in the lab where someone's trying to determine, can we freeze a mosquito at a certain time? Similar to like um, C. elegans nematodes, mm -hmm. you can basically take them and store them forever. You can freeze them forever, um, basically. And then once you pull them out, they're, they're ready to go. So this is like a good thing to store like any sort of genetically modified worms. Um, so we're trying to see, is there a way we can do that here? And is that kind of speaking to how, how they're able to survive the winter? Because they obviously need to. There obviously needs to be some sort of mechanism for them to survive. Otherwise, we would never see them again. And that would also be really beneficial for the storage of them, right? So like you don't have to really pay attention to them. You can just feed them whenever or like, you know, bring them out of the freezer, restart a colony yeah. and then just move on, I guess similar to the uh, tardigrades, right? Where they have the tons stay and they're able to just stay like that until you rehydrate them and then they're ready right. to go again. Yeah, unclear if this is gonna work in the mosquito, but like, it's it's a question people are asking. So I guess one day we'll see the answer to that. I mean, that that would be phenomenal for, for so many different um, elements to it. Uh, and then the, the I know we started squirreling and rabbit holing, but was, <laughs> um, does each mosquito lay a certain amount then die? We're just continuing to make eggs. And I guess further in that question, you were mentioning that if you don't let them lay, like you don't give them a blood meal, they can survive their little lives and they'll go mosquito heaven. Um, are their lifespans longer if you don't give them access and they don't have to lay? Or like, is there any difference there, like in terms of lifespan between the two? Yeah, um, we had someone who actually did this experiment and there wasn't like a huge difference. Um, okay. at least in the lab not sure about in the wild but in the lab with optimal conditions and like someone literally giving them sugar water and taking care of them they will last like a non-blood fed mosquito's lifespan i think we've kept them alive for like 30 days wait that's so not true <laughs> i think it was like 60 days it was i was like no way it was way more than that they can survive for a really long time i've forgotten about cages and then i come back a couple months later and i'm like oh there's a couple of you left good job um <laughs> That's but awesome. yeah those are the talented ones um the, but, the, what, the what kind i said those are the talented ones oh they're talented okay i, I was like wait a minute <laughs> no 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 nothing special except for they're special um but what was i gonna say oh yeah uh in terms of how many eggs will they lay each go around they can lay almost like 200 eggs per female wow. um which is wild um so what am i trying to say yeah so they can lay like around 200 per um and then they can go through another they have to they have to take blood each time they're going to make eggs so like they can go through four you know like blood feeding cycles and do four different sets of egg laying. Um, and then like, they die from old age. Like I have, it's unclear like what, you know, affects their longevity, but they have access to nutrients and things like that. They can go, but aging is always something that, you know, will impact an organism's ability to do whatever it's doing. Um, but we don't know a lot about mosquito aging yet. Gotcha, so it's at least not in the lab, not the blood meal and the activation of these cells that leads to them to like have accelerated aging or something like that. Yeah, un unclear. I mean, I don't know if that, like, I don't know if anyone's actually asked that specific question, mm -hmm. but you know, it's kind of unclear. Nice. It's a, uh, it's, it highlights too how you're saying that how little is still known about them. Like you feel like we should know all these like basic fundamentals about them, but there's still so little that we know yeah, it's, it's funny too, there's, 
we'll also like as a lab be like oh we don't know the answer to this question and then we'll do some digging and find some written report from the 1930s that'll be like oh here's every answer to that question we just wanted to know so it's like it's really weird the research is kind of everywhere mm -hmm. um there was like a huge like we okay so like for example a lot of things to do with the anatomy we didn't know what certain organs were supposed to look like and we we're like we're just gonna find them and hope we find them so like for me the reproductive tract um i was like well i'm gonna go in and see what i can pull out <laughs> see if that'll and then someone found a book from 1982 that was hundreds of pages of all of these illustrations of insects of fighting of blood feeding insects someone had drawn every little thing and they had drawn like the entire like nervous system of the mosquito stomach and like all these and i'm like wait where did this come from um so like we have a copy of this book just kind of sitting so anytime anyone needs to look we can flip through it but it's like you never know with mosquitoes you never know what's already been done until you've really done a deep dive it's like not that easy to find information and a lot of these experiments too um that were kind of establishing the field of mosquito science um arguably like would need to be redone because the more we know about them now there's a few holes in some of them but there's still really really great information that we're able to get from random experiments people were doing back in the 50s and 60s and 70s it's really neat to see the connection then with like the historical side of things too like looking back and seeing what was done how it can inform you now but like you said like the techniques are so different and like newer techniques that it would have to be redone anyway do we have yeah. any any pictures of some of the dissections that you were saying like when you just like opened up and looking in for those like those connections um, so opening up and looking in no these are all stained images um but if you want to pull i'm like trying to look uh there's one i think it's called full reproductive tract yep. um okay did i maybe i sent hold on go go back go back is there another one? Oh, the do the one at the bottom um oh okay so so to orient everybody here was kind of a crude dissection of the reproductive tract that i had like stitched together also crude um but <laughs> let's just go with it um but basically what we have here um are the ovaries like i was just showing so we should be familiar with those um but this time they're connected to everything else um and everything in blue is dappy which is staining for the nucleus of cells um and so we typically use this as a counter stain for everything because um one it's helpful to like know the morphology of a cell um and know where the nucleus is supposed to be um and for me it's really helpful and like having a good structural look at what i what i've dissected um and then yeah so basically what you can see here are the two ovaries connected um and connected to them are what are called oviducts and so, so you, you can, can imagine, imagine that the eggs are passing down, down into these oviducts where, where it meets in the middle and then there's a common oviduct um and you can think about it similar to like a fallopian tube kind of situation um if that helps um with like conceptualizing this um so it goes down to the common oviduct and then you have um if you want to zoom in a little bit so you can see these like black balls like that are kind of yeah. right yeah those, those right there those are called the spermatheci and these are storage organs for male sperm another fun thing about this species of mosquitoes is that they only mate once in their life and so whichever male gets to them first that male sperm will be stored in those little pockets for their the entirety of their life That's cool. and so every clutch of eggs is going to be that sperm fertilizing those eggs so does that make genetics on these animals easier for that um, reason it, it can we just have to like be so like we have to be really careful if we know we want to do crosses we have to make sure that whenever we can sex the mosquitoes which is in their pupil stage mm -hmm. um that we sex them and keep them apart so we have virgin females and then we can pick whatever male we want and vice yeah. versa and do the genetic crosses that way can one male yeah. like 
mate multiple times, so in theory, if you when you sex them, if there was just one wrong, then they're all gonna be mated. Yeah, basically, basically that is what happens. So if like you, if if some people are not great at sexing for some reason, that's like the thing I could do with my eyes closed. Like I'm just like okay, boom, 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 and it's fine. But some people like a male will get in there. Um, if you catch that at a certain time, so once they emerge into like adulthood and get their wings and everything, um, we will put them into cages. And if you catch the male within the first couple days of that happening, it's fine because they they aren't like fully sexually mature yet. Okay, um, so what, right when they hatch, they're not ready to go to mate. Versus like a fruit yeah. fly is hatched and the male is ready. Yeah, like the like the mosquitoes, they gotta dry off. Like they're coming out of water. Okay. They've got to, like, harden a little bit. Huh. Um, and then at some point, then they start doing what they need to do. So, yeah, if you have a rogue male in a cage of virgin females, you can just, like, assume that most of them are messed up. At Ex that except point. if you time it right, like you were saying. Yeah, yeah. Nice. If you don't catch it, then, yeah, you're, you're kind of screwed. But, like, if you're, if you're fine, if, if you, like, if you do catch them, then it's usually okay. Um, but you know, no one wants to be in that position anyways. It's just kind of like, we usually sex them and we'll do like 10 females that we feel really good about in a cup and then mm -hmm. another 10 and then another 10 and another 10. So like if one of your cups happens to have a male, that's okay. You have other cups. Um, that makes sense. Yeah. So we just try to avoid it as much as possible. Um, but yeah, so basically right at the, um, there's like a kind of like a bright, looks like a white kind of strip um in this image underneath the spermatiki yep right uh, here yeah right there. yep so that's basically those are neurons one two that is the uterus and so that is where all the magic happens so once the egg gets down there there's like a perfect timing of things the sperm's released and squeezed out of the spermatiki and meets the egg there and then uh it passes through you can't really see very well here but then it passes through the rest of the tract mm -hmm. um and yeah then you have a, a laid egg a laid fertilized egg um yeah so i like i said i was interested in neurons so if you want to go back to the other full image that i've mentioned what we can see here in green are all the neurons um in this preparation there are more because sometimes they can get ripped off uh, um so when you're dissecting them out they're not how to say it. they're like surface on the ovary some yeah, sometimes okay yeah so, so like, you have to be really careful in doing these dissections otherwise presumably internal structures as you're removing them can get hooked on and you're pulling them right. out okay gotcha right i actually just like had the realization a couple weeks ago that i i was doing these dissections under just like just like the regular dissection scope like no fluorescence or anything like that i was using a line that like this is all like internal gfp i was using a line that i could have dissected under fluorescence but i did not and then i realized that i was ripping off so many neurons um and even when i took this image i was like oh great caught them all definitely not there are so many more that are like lining that ov duct we can see one um that's kind of on the left side that one this one here yep um in my other preparations um there are so many more that are lining that are kind of like wrapping around the ov duct they think that these may be like sensing stretch or helping control contractions to help like coordinate the timing of the eggs movement because you have to coordinate the egg movement with the release of the sperm it's all so like temporally regulated it's it's a it's just beautiful um so those I ripped off a lot, but then the ones that are a little bit lower down, those are pretty consistent. Um, like, so that, that uterine This lining, is the one we just saw, right? Like, was in, in yeah. white? Yeah. Right. Um, so those, those are more internalized. So even under, like, not dissecting under fluorescence, those usually don't get ripped off. Um, but there's a lot, there's a lot of neurons here, basically. So that's why I said my project's still kind of at the beginning stages. I'm going to characterize these um so, and determine kind of what they're expressing and so Lola, like. what does that mean so for the yeah. party people at home like yeah because that sounds like a very herculean task is i'm going yeah. to characterize these like what does that entail because like what i right. guess a what 
it, it sounds like we don't really know anything about these neurons to begin with. Mm -hmm. To what do you, what do you need to do to figure out what the neurons do? Like what what right. does that even entail? And like how much do you need to find out to be satisfied that you figured out enough with it? Right. So these are all good questions. Um, sorry, my cat's being chaotic. I'm hoping she doesn't like turn off my lights. Please don't. <laughs> it's like laying on the light switch. She's like doing it on purpose. Um, anyways, so yes, characterizing is such like a big word. But what I'm basically trying to do is determine what types of neurons these are. What we do know about neurons in you and me and a mouse and a cat is that neurons are doing different things. They are releasing different types of neurotransmitters or neuromodulators. And we know what some of these things do. For example, at our, basically the reason why we're able to move our hands is because there's some sort of communication between muscle and between neurons. And we know that in humans, what is kind of controlling this is acetylcholine, a neurotransmitter. Acetylcholine also, you know, contributes to mammalian focus and things like that. Um, I'm like, I'm like, I'm trying to remember my mammal stuff. Um, in insects, it's not acetylcholine that controls muscle movement. It's glutamate. And so we know these little things about some of the different neurotransmitters and what they could be doing in other systems. And so my question here is, I have all these neurons here. Are they expressing glutamate? That's going to help me understand, okay, are these contributing to motor function? Are these contributing to the movement of the muscle themselves? Um, and so what we're doing is basically trying to put together a puzzle. Um, we have, I, I'm gonna use another puzzle, like the puzzle metaphor again, but like we have a bunch of pieces and we understand what some of these small different chunks of the puzzle could look like, but how do they all, how do they all contribute to each other? Because we don't know how the system operates entirely. So we don't know exactly the process of like, okay, an egg starts passing through. We don't know if it then starts sensing stretch or if the OB duct is gonna start moving on its own. We don't know any of those questions, but we have these cells and what we can do is try and stain for some of these different neurotransmitters or different proteins of interest that we do know their function and try to infer what their function could be in the reproductive tract. And so I feel like for me to be happy I would just like to understand the identity of these neurons. What are their neurotransmitters? Because I think that could open up a lot more questions um, in the future, because it'd be cool to know like, okay, glutamate is the, is kind of like the main operating neurotransmitter in this system. You can then ask other questions based on that, but we don't even really know what, we don't even know the baseline. So honestly, it's kind of going in blind and hoping that something comes out, which I feel like is a lot of science. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> it's just, I guess it's really cool to think about how you can build the experimental design, right? Like you were saying, figuring out, like we, we can see that here are the neurons, right? And then figuring out what's inside the neurons based on like existing data that we have in other insects. And then I guess my difficulty is like trying to visualize how, how does one demonstrate that this neuron is for like the changing of the shape of the oviduct, right? Like there's like in my mind, there's almost a disconnect of how I can visualize something like that. Cause I want to be able to break it without, yeah. and then see, how would you see it if it's broken? And RT, thank you for the biddies. Appreciate you. Yeah. So the way I've been thinking about it or here, I will say back in the day I was, trying to figure out what components of nematode neurons like what were the definitive characteristics of the specific neuron like i want i have this one neuron i want to know every single gene it expresses. i want to know every sort of protein that is there um because then i know specifically what makes this neuron this neuron and i think we could do something similar here so a step from glutamate or whatever I then can use other markers that we have. We have marker, we have information about chemosensory neurons in the reproductive tract. So like, okay, I can then stain and be like, okay, here's a chemosensory marker. 
is this responding to a chemical? Okay, maybe not. We have ones that are mechanoreceptors. So anything that's responding to any sort of like stress, like tensile stress, pulling or something like that, or stretch, we can also stain for that. And so that is kind of how the visuals would work. It's basically like I would take this image and overlap it with as many different stains as I can to kind of understand, okay, great, we have glutamate here. Great, we have this mechanosensory receptor here. Okay, we have this here. Maybe then we can infer kind of what is going on. And there's also the potential for any sort of reproductive system specific things. So then you can, once you have that kind of map of that neuron, you can break the map. You can, you know what to cut out. So there's a stain, what you're saying is, do you have to poke the mosquito before doing the stain to see if it's a, me a mechanical something or another neuron like or do you just stain it and that like there's a feature of this neuron that tells you it's mechanical sensation and that'll then start glowing too like do you have to do something ahead of time to the actual mosquito to trigger this i think it depends on what you want to do i really love microscopy and yeah. i really love creating beautiful or like at least being able to take pictures of beautiful things like this and so that's always my starting point um, there are some papers out there that have taken, like we had to one establish that mosquitoes, that mosquito reproductive systems had contractions. And so there are papers out there where people basically took out the reproductive tract and put it in different solutions um, that were like basically bathing it in different neurotransmitters. Oh, wow. Wait, so like the tissue's happened. still alive? Well, the, the tissue was alive, yeah, not for long, but yeah. Wow, so that's we, really, really cool. Yeah. That's so, so cool. Uh, and so with that, even with that information, that's helpful in kind of helping me figure out what I'd want to stain for. It's like, great. So if you put this whole system in a bath that's full of um, octopamine. Octopamine is not in humans, but it's basically like... Any sort of reproductive, any, anything that like contributes to like human reproduction, octopamine does that for insects. Um, so like if I take the system, dissect it out, and put it in a, like a thing of octopamine, and it starts contracting, great. For me, I can be like, great, which neurons are the ones that are responding to octopamine? Okay, so, so, so really, oh, silly, really silly question. Does that mean that when you put in these, like you have the glowing neurons, right? Like from that GFB, that green fluorescent protein one that you've made, right? Mm -hmm. You have them glowing. Can you put them and bathe them in this octopamine? And then can you see the ones firing? Or is that a, something totally different that you'll have to do afterwards? That's something else, but we do have, so basically how these are glowing green, um, I'll keep it brief. We basically have, uh, a, like a driver so basically it's like in every neuron we have a neuron driver in every neuron we want it to express green fluorescent protein everywhere i also have a line where i have green green fluorescent protein only in the cell bodies so like you can basically pick whatever you want um but this gfp is just for visuals we do have a line that in every neuron like the neuron driver with g camp so that is calcium modulation. And so when neurons are firing, calcium is released. And so if we use that G-CAMP line and we're looking under a scope that can read calcium output, we can then see that. And this is also another thing that, um, I know they do this in fruit flies quite a bit um, in their reproductive systems to kind of understand how their neurons work. Um, so yeah, if you have the right line, probably a G-CAMP line where you're measuring calcium output you can see the neurons as they're firing that's amazing I, I love the idea that of putting them into these like bathe receptors and like having stuff firing that is really remarkable yeah the calcium imaging is like so pretty i've never done it i want to see um if i can find this really beautiful calcium imaging that was done in the mosquito silent which is the part that bites us um, oh okay yeah yeah yeah, so someone in my lab um, was basically trying to see what components of blood actually activate the stylet. Um, let me see if I can find this video for you. I think I think people would enjoy this one. It's really pretty. Um, we we are we are 
we have a we we also love microscopy here. Like this whole every oh, no. okay. every Monday is full on like it's microscopy Monday for us. So like these beautiful oh, pictures, okay. I think people are loving it. So any kind okay, of picture great. you want to share. <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll uh, keep looking for that. But you know, I'm open to more questions, of course. Oh, I'm reading about these microscopes that you use. No fluorescent microscopes yet. One day. Mm. One day. That'd be super cool. Yeah, I mean, honestly, these are a lot more exciting than the samples I was going to send anyways, because it just looks like just like a chunk of tissue. The thing um, is, Lola, even the chunks of tissues we love here. Okay, <laughs> like, I do appreciate that. Yeah, I also I also appreciate the chunks of tissue. Yeah, because like I just think just structurally, like I'm still kind of blown away on this structure of the ovary. I mean, A, this is a beautiful image, right? Like this is a beautiful video that you sent us. But also, it is so fundamentally different from what we see in a fruit fly. Like in a yeah. fruit, in a, like what I'm used to seeing, right, is there's like these little population of stem cells called germaria at the tip, and then you move along this little line, and each cell gets bigger and bigger and bigger, and then the final one is the biggest, and that's what gets laid. Versus this looks like more a bushel of grapes. Yeah. And Basically, it's just, it's just so different. I mean, it's, it's remarkable, but it's just really different. Yeah, you know, I I will say. Like in fruit flies, I, I look to fruit flies so much um, to even understand what questions to start asking about this system because we don't know a lot about the mosquito, but there's been substantial work done in Drosophila. Um, and I mean, not like substantial, but like good work done in locusts and butterflies. And so, a lot of what I'm doing here, since we're kind of going in blind, is seeing if there's any sort of, if there are any, like, I don't know, commonalities between these systems that can help me understand what, like, what a neuron in the same part of the mosquito reproductive tract is doing, if we know what it's doing in other animals. It's, so, it's super and, cool. You're like the pioneering the very beginnings of this, right? Like, no one knows. You're the first one to start looking at these things, and it's, that's super exciting. And, and I guess along the similar lines, you had a question from our friend Fishman. What's the most surprising fact you've learned about mosquitoes so far? Ooh, uh, most surprising fact. Um, I don't know. I think specifically about the biology of the mosquito. Um, mm, that's tough. That's really hard. Honestly, the fact that this entire reproductive system exists like blew my mind. Um, <laughs> I I'm like really that, biased yeah. and that may not be a great answer, but that is one of the craziest things to me. Um, I'm really interested um, also like in the history of mosquito work. Um, and so I've recently found like, I've gone down quite a few rabbit holes of um, experiments that were done with mosquitoes that I think are just insane um and problematic because what would science be if the history is not problematic at certain <laughs> points um but yeah i'm like if anyone if anyone needs to know about a crazy mosquito experiment let me know um but yeah i don't know i just think just the beauty of the system i think just how complex the reproductive system can be i just it's just crazy like i don't even know tell us do you really want to know I, i'll tell you okay absolutely we, we really want to know <laughs> great want to hear of one crazy experience go on okay great um most recently i've learned about this experiment called operation big buzz um so in the 50s this is all like released in a now unclassified army document um where the united states government dropped like i can't remember what it specifically is i also don't know if i can say these things on chat but like like they dropped like a big box <laughs> full of mosquitoes on savannah georgia um what heard of on savannah yet. georgia on savannah georgia um this ties into 
the rich history of scientists kind of taking advantage of certain populations of people because this is particularly in black neighborhoods in Savannah where they were dropping three, I think they dropped that summer 300,000 non-infected mosquitoes, but mosquitoes nonetheless. And the question they were trying to answer was one, if we take these mosquitoes, infect them, and then drop them into like the tropics, wherever the current enemy was at the time, can we infect everybody? Can we like actually wreak havoc and use these as a bioweapon? Um, and then the other question they were just wondering was like, how far will a mosquito go to find a human? Like, will they kind of recover from the trauma of being dropped and go find a blood source and try to thrive? Um, so I recently found out about that one. That one was really something. Wow, that's, so <laughs> did they find anything out of that? It just seems like it just, they, the, the mosquitoes went and bit people. Like, yeah, well, like that doesn't seem are. like it, right? Like if the goal is to be like, oh, let's figure out how far it's spread. First of all, don't do it on your own population, right? But also, if it's just on it, I, I just don't, how would you even track something like that? It just doesn't seem well thought out at all. No. So uh, apparently what they were doing was like knocking on the doors and being like, hey, did mosquitoes get into your house this summer? Like, how are things? And people were like, yeah actually yeah and they're like okay great yikes but yeah like what that is was like, that was literally it um they did this so many they did this like so many other times too i found there was Oper operation dropkick i think that was a year later and they did it in florida again in a like impoverished black community like it was there was this weird commonality I found this out because people were interviewing older black people why they won't get the COVID vaccine. And it was like, uh, why would we trust a scientist? I got mosquito bites like so bad for like a whole summer because no one told me what was happening. Um, and so like, I don't know, there's like all these, you know, there's a, there's a sordid past with the research. Um, and like, this also speaks to why I like want to be able to speak to people is like, I don't know, reestablishing that trust. I don't know if it was there for a lot of people, for a lot of, you know, at risk communities in the United States. I don't know if that relationship was ever there because it was frequently taken, like these people were frequently taken advantage of by scientists. Yeah. And so at this point, we now have the opportunity to not take advantage of people and to perform ethical research and ask good questions and design good experiments to answer those questions. Um, but yeah, that doesn't erase the fact that the other, the old ones happened. So that's been my most recent rabbit hole is wow. really strange mosquito experiments. I just big old yikes on all of that, right? Yeah. And uh, yeah. yeah, it's I think it's important how you're highlighting that it also kind of explains, at least in part, like mistrust of science today. Um, there's, I mean, I think there's a bunch of other issues too when, you know, I think you're doing great work because you're, a humanizing science right and making it accessible i think there's a whole sect of people too that are in a huge position of you know like intellectual power in terms of research but then they don't want to disseminate that information or they feel like they're the regular non-science people aren't worthy of that knowledge i feel like that adds more to that distrust right and so it's yeah. so many different factors and that's another reason why i would thank you for doing what you do is kind of demystifying some of that scientific background yeah and like jargon can get really not fun to listen to and so i think it's important for us as i can't find that video i was looking for by the way i cannot find it um no, no worries but it's okay um yeah i don't know i think making science accessible and exciting is really the key um I don't know. Like, I, I don't like the idea. I, I don't like that phrase when people say, like, dumb things down because I don't think that people are stupid. I think they just aren't be. It's like being given a book upside down. Like, who's supposed to be able to read that? Um, and so I think it's just really important for us as scientists to make sure that this information is out there and inspire people to want to ask more questions. Yeah, and it's it's... I feel like it's one of those things that if you are able to explain it in simplistic terms and you also understand it right if you can take away the jargon and you could explain it without the jargon then you truly then you truly understand the subject you're explaining and i would argue like 
even between us, like, yeah, I have my PhD in molecular genetics, but I have no idea of, like, these mosquito bits, and so you, I don't think you're dumbing it down at all, and it's just, like, making it accessible and how we're chatting about it here on the stream, and that's, yeah. like, important for just, for science communication between scientists and then outside of that world as well. Yeah, absolutely. Totally agree. So given the connection that you're looking at with like the brain and the ovary and the neurons i did see there were some of my second favorite kind of images which there's some brain images here can we look at some yeah. of those and walk through yeah I'll, I'll give a brief history um while you're pulling those up so as i mentioned at one point i was studying the brain and reproductive system connection um issue was we didn't have any sections of the brain um, and there's very little, no, I would say in the grand scheme of what's known about bugs and mosquitoes, there is little known about the mosquito brain. In fact, the argument that I kept hearing my first couple years was, do mosquitoes even have a brain? Yes. I heard that with flies too. They do in fact have a brain. Um, we had someone who did like a very intense electron microscopy kind of, um, let me see if I can. I could probably find that a little bit easier. Um, yeah, I can drop, I'll drop this in the chat for people to go to. Um, but like they did this whole experiment where they were trying to map out um, like the mosquito brain um, and try to see if we can understand any of the regions that were there. Um, there's like a little bit known about it. Um, like, they kind of took the brain regions that are in um, in fruit flies and tried to overlay them or like try to find, you know, similar regions in the mosquito brain. Um, not sure where the project is. The person who was doing this is not in the lab anymore, so I don't know if they're doing it there. But I had a project where uh, I was trying to get like good visualization. Like I was trying to be able to stain the brain in the similar way that I was staining the reproductive system. Um, but what I, the problem I kept coming across is the outside of the brain would be stained really nicely. And then it would just like a, it would look like a black hole on the inside, which yep. is fine. Like it wasn't fine, but like, it was kind of like, oh, don't worry about it. But there's an issue. There are cells in there. Something should be stained. And if you don't, for those at home, DAPI, that nucleus marker that I was talking about, all those blue dots in my other images it stains everything <laughs> and so you should be able to see daffy if you can't see daffy something's wrong um and so i was never able to like penetrate the, the you know the, the middle of the brain and so i started doing slices of the brain so i would take the brain out dissect it i would basically embed it in like a very small like block of ice and then i would have to like take this little machine and like crank thin slices of the brain, 14 microns, which is small. You can look it up if you, I, I can't even <laughs> visualize what 14 microns is, but very, very small, thin layers of the brain. And the project at one point was to try and like map and try and like kind of do what these people did in the mosquitobrains.org thing, but like on slides, couldn't do it. But what I did send to you were two of the slides that looked okay. <laughs> okay, so was it was it the technical difficulty of doing the slicing or was it just that the stains still weren't getting in there? Um, the stains were getting in there, um, which um, we can see in those images. Um, but what was not working, okay, okay so, so here, here like, like I, I said, said, blue, blue is dappy. dappy. Um, and then just a little getting... little orientation for us, like um, right. where are these circle bits on either side or like the eyes? And then is this like um, the bottom part would be where the mouth is or like how, how should we orient ourselves right. looking at this? Absolutely. So you see like the kind of ridges on the outside. That is, these are the eyes. Okay. Um, so this is a section that like, I'm going to turn like this way. It was taken like right here, like right at the front. Okay. Um, so the eyes are, are here. So that's like the the retina. Yeah. Okay. Um. And so if there's like a little hole kind of near the bottom that you were pointing at, 
Um, is it? Uh, no, left there. That. That is where um, the mouthpiece like starts going into the into the brain. Oh wow! Um, okay. So, like, right underneath the brain is this little pouch, basically, that all the blood will pass through before it goes into the the digestive tract. So it's like right under the head. So, um, silly question, is there anything that cools down the blood as it enters that area? Because it's like, otherwise you're submitting the brain to a lot of heat all of a sudden. Um, That's a good question. I have no clue. And now I'm going to ask, because that's really, really cool. I didn't even think about that. Um, yeah, so those t there's like two little holes that kind of look like just little eyes right above that. That's, um, yeah. These two? Okay. That's uh, that's where the um, that's where the antennae are like kind of coming in. Um, wow, oh, wow, that's, like, it's just wild to see this kind of view, like that that side cut, and almost like seeing where these elements are sticking into the head. Right. Um, yeah. So as I mentioned, the DAPI is those little blue dots. That's just all the cells and all of their like nuclei. Um, the green is. Um, not real that is just auto fluorescence so like i needed something else to counteract the daffy stain so i just kind of hyped up the laser it doesn't matter um yeah so that's that one you want to go to the other one because you can see a little bit deeper into the brain um i believe this one's kind of folded so don't mind the folding it was really hard to oh this one's not folded it's just missing a chunk <laughs> so here's deeper into the brain <laughs> so um similar on the side you have the eyes or you can like see kind of where the it's a, where is, the eyes it's a front on view now uh yeah it's still yep. no no okay so when i was saying um when i was turning to the side i was just showing you like the depth they're all front on oh oh wow then i'm totally like, lost on the other one yeah um okay. and then this is just a little bit further back gotcha and so here are the optic lobes right so the equivalent of this region here mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and that's what we're seeing here yep and then these little ridges are those mm -hmm. the individual omatidium yeah okay gotcha yeah um so yeah deeper in the brain basically what i was saying is even in all of my other if i was just taking the full brain and trying to stain them, I would not see a lot of this daffy. And that's when I knew there was a problem. Mm -hmm. um, but I was able to kind of see a little bit deeper there. I have no clue what the brain regions are. Um, it did. We didn't go that deep into it. <laughs> um, but there's that hole again that I was mentioning. Is um, it this one? Yeah. That kind of goes like, right, yeah. So it's interesting that as you like go through the brain, it kind of moves position. Yeah. Um, is this is this where like the ventral nerve cord is going to be kicking in eventually? So the ventral nerve cord is a lot more in the back and also when I dissect like that that is a completely separate dissection. I don't know if anyone's been able to get it all connected at one time. Um but basically once you hit the neck of a mosquito like the decapitation of them it's just like it's completely separate so like the ventral nerve cord is starting kind of in that neck area mm -hmm. um further down um gotcha so that'd probably be like around here yeah and then deeper um yeah yeah i see there's a, a second deeper brain section image yeah here. this one might be the folded one so for those who have not had to slice a brain ever the tissue folds it's yeah so at the bottom you can see it's kind of like folded up onto itself because yeah exactly gotcha this reaction is exactly my thought um <laughs> but you can still see the same features that we were just talking about the optic lobe is kind of like folded back up on itself but regardless the key here was that i was finally able to get a, you know resolution deeper into the brain um but sadly, I didn't do any more with this project. I now am the advisor for people for how to stain the brain, though. So, like, people do ask me. I've had to teach people how to cut up little brains, and it's really something. We use, like, um, this little metal apparatus that's, like, I'm trying to, like, okay, so, like, here's my head. <laughs> it's, like, a small metal block, and basically we have to thread the mosquito by its neck 
into this block. And so we'll line them up. And then I'm going to find a picture for this. This is, this is easy. I can do this. Um, basically, we line them up, and then we can freeze them in place. And then it's really weird. Let me see if I can find. Uh, they typically do this in Drosophila, but I was able to rig it to like work for mosquitoes. Um, Um, but yeah, so it's a lot of, okay, this is, this is, okay. Um, I'm going to send like a picture. Can I send a picture in the chat? I've never used Twitch before. Uh, if it's a link, yes. Uh, otherwise, um, I mean, you can drop it in that Google Drive. It'll update. We can take a look there too. That's so true. I'm going to do that really fast so I can explain how I even had to do this. Um, okay. Okay. Okay, I've I've dropped it in. Oh wait. There we go. It's called F seven large. I don't know why. Got it. All right. Um <laughs> oh I my my head's kinda big in the way. Um but basically you just take the bug and line it and like thread it through. So then you have like six of them lined up. And when they, fr when you freeze them in the little block of ice I was talking about, you basically just break it off. And then you have like six perfectly lined up heads and then you put it on a machine, which is, which they show in C. Mm -hmm. um, and then you basically like cut perfect sections each time. So like, wow. So they're, they're in ice. It's in it's in a compound. It's called uh, optimal cutting compound or something like that. I don't remember. Um, but basically, you freeze it to like negative like seventy Fahrenheit, and it doesn't fully freeze it, so it can be sliced. But it's frozen enough that you can slice it without, if you do it right, without like messing up with the morphology of the sample. Nice. Clearly, I had some that were like really folded because a lot of things can happen. Sometimes the razor is too warm and so it'll melt the tissue or it'll melt the ice around the tissue and then it'll like mess it up. But um, yeah. Oh, yeah. Perf perfect. I, I, I cannot. Um, I'm not good with like my. Uh, what's it called? Changing Fahrenheit to Celsius. So thank it, you for that. For me, it's like I understand lab numbers in Celsius and yeah. then real world numbers in Fahrenheit, and I cannot jump in between the two of them. Yeah. I'm like, I know what minus 20 feels like. I know what minus 80 is. Yep. And I know the 25 degree C incubator, but then if you tell me what's the equivalent out, I'm, I'm, I don't, I don't know. <laughs> I have no yeah, idea. For sure. So does for this sure. does this tool allow you to section in like decreasing segments where you can take a section and then take again and take again and kind of almost put the images back together if you were to image each one individually? So that's what I was trying to do because the idea is like I would have on a slide just all these different sections like maybe on six or seven slides just all the different sections and maybe like we have like a nice uh, bioimaging group here and they, they, they're good at like doing those types of things but I never got to that point but that was kind of the goal it was like okay if I can section each part of the brain same you know equal size sections can we put it back together I hope someone does it sometime though um, maybe maybe someone maybe someone will ask me to help them do it and I'm like great you can go back to that I know some people are trying to do that on like transmission electron microscopy sections of like they did it on fruit fly adult and larval mm -hmm. brains i i mean i imagine the resolution right is much finer than what we're able to get on this because the is the are the images here that you were taking like confocal images yeah okay so like we're limited on the res but the same principle would be applying here yeah i mean the good thing is like or the good thing that would if if, if this had continued is that these sections were so thin that the resolution at least like you could i don't know 
it was a lot easier to image these sections than it was to image a whole brain and had good resolution throughout because I even have this issue with my reproductive tract. It's a thin tissue, but still, if I'm imaging, if I'm trying to take pictures of like throughout the stack, throughout the tissue itself, some parts are like blurry or just not the best resolution. And so it's not ideal, but I don't know. I think that's the fun part about microscopy because like once a new microscope comes out, I'm like, yes, like <laughs> let me try it. Uh, yeah, absolutely. And it's like the higher the res and like the, I don't know, I like not having to do something like the electron microscopy portion of it, just, but just like having, if you could have the whole tissue, like you were saying under the scope without any kind of cuts, it's like having that right power and the optics behind it and just seeing more deep into it and how things might connect, it would be a really cool additional tool to be able to have there. Yeah, for sure. I, that's, the, that's the fun thing about mosquitoes too, is like, if anyone, if someone really, oh no, there's an echo. Sometimes Twitch guest star cuts into an echo and there's nothing we could do about it unfortunately okay well i'm sorry no that's I'll... not you that's not you and that's not even me on this one that's sometimes it just cuts into an echo and then it randomly will stop and like we will have pressed nothing <laughs> okay well i'm gonna let you know twitch deal with that one <laughs> um what was i what was i saying oh yeah the thing i really like about mosquitoes and if anyone ever wanted to do like mosquito research but couldn't even think of a project is we need so many tools we need so many things the amount of engineering projects that happen in our lab because we don't have like we don't have things we have to build them from scratch um we have like a this is commonly used with fruit flies but like we have a system where you put the mosquito on a ball and like glue its head so you can see where it walks like we're tracking, we're doing like virtual reality with bugs these days. And like, someone had to think of that. And so it's so, I don't know, it's just so inspiring. There's so, there's so many opportunities for people to get involved and like use their skills. Um, so it's like an endless, it's an endless field. It's great. Yeah. Is there, if you could have any tool right now, what tool would that be? Like, what would be the most helpful tool right now for your work? Um, a micro dissector. I know those exist, but I don't know how to use it. And I, I don't know anyone who's used it, but basically I would like something that would dissect out my tissue perfectly. Is there uh, something that does that with other things? More or less. So wow. actually there was like a, there was a little gland. If you want, do you want to go back to my, um, if you go back to my full, the one that says full merge, uh, full not that one uh... it's at the bottom the last one um okay so down to the right there's like a little bulb kind of sticking out this guy yes um that is the female accessory gland what she does we don't it's unclear but we think one there's a lot of neurons there um but two we think that it helps regulate the action of the spermatheci and so like the neurons there are somehow correlating to the neurons that are controlling sperm release. No clue. Anyways, there is this paper that dissected like hundreds of this little gland. And I was shocked because I could barely reliably dissect two. Um, but they somehow did an entire sequencing project just on this gland. Wow. Um, and I was looking at, I was like, how did they do it? I went to the methods and they said they used a micro dissector. Um, and so what I'd love is a micro dissector that could basically see all of like those neurons that I was potentially ripping out and be able to dissect around them. Like I would love that so that everything could come out in one piece. That would be, that would be really cool. Yeah. I'm like, that would be a bit amazing for all of the fly brain dissections I have to do too. And then you can start getting like, individual sec segments of it too hopefully that would be amazing yeah. yeah um so as we're waiting for uh anyone else from chat please also ask uh what are here's another nice close-up of the ovaries for for this okay. image here i think this is like a zoom in of the the grape bushels that we were looking at right. um the red being that reproductive tract mm -hmm. right and then 
if you could just remind us so like this is the vitellin genin in the green is that what the embryo is going to become or is the embryo just kind of already set here and that's just going to be feeding it later on so vitellogenin being a yolk precursor, um, it's like basically, could, it's basically going to become the yolk okay. of the egg. And so those other cells um, are kind of just floating in cytoplasm, um, but uh, basically they will feed, they will feed like the, uh, the, the yolk as it starts forming. And so I don't have an image of this on here, but um, if you take a mosquito like later on, basically, I want to say like 48 hours, maybe 36 to 48 hours after they've taken a blood meal, that green would be really tiny because it's like after that system's been like activated by the blood, that yolk pre precursor protein receptors, like they don't, it, it'll just shrink because the yolk has now been starting to like form and is being fed by the rest of the cells. Oh, uh, okay. Gotcha. So it other, but otherwise, if you keep them without a blood meal, right, for the entire life, it would stay like a static. That's really cool. Like the response between, again, like the feeding the blood and the, the development of the ovary. And like you were saying, connection from brain to ovary again is presumably yeah. very important. Yeah. And so I, I feel like I'm still asking that question with the project I'm doing, mm -hmm. just in a different way now. Like instead of, I think it was a bit ambitious to start off and be like, okay, how does the brain communicate with the ovaries or the reproductive tract? We don't even know the neurons in the reproductive tract that would be communicated with. So I'm like, wait, we got to pause. Let me ask that question first. So like it still can feed that question and like can be built on by either me or someone else someday. But I think it's like a good place to start and still really interesting. Um, and like, even though I'm not doing anything related to like what this project that like these images are for, um, it still provided such a good framework for me to be able to ask questions about dreams, the reproductive not tract and things like that. Limitations. Um, what does that mean? Yeah, it's like, I like that the research, even if it's not what I was originally doing, it all just kind of builds on each other. Absolutely. And is there, can you tell us about the approaches that you're taking now? Like you said, it's still a lot of imaging, but like, what are the steps that you've taken so far in the current project that you're working on like what are some future steps what tools that you need to make like what would help you answer the overall question right so i would say the priority at this point is basically trying to get my perfect image of all the neurons that are in the reproductive tract so things that when they're not ripped off everything's still connected um so we can kind of have an idea of like what the circuitry could be. So that's one thing. Um, the next thing, this is actually an experiment that I did. I basically did a sequencing experiment where I basically clipped at the end of each ovaries and took everything else. Um, well, well, okay, hold on. The, yeah. So you took like the oviduct and then like these, these all these cells below and mm -hmm. not, and not uh, any of the embryos, right? none of those because they will cloud up there's like the ovaries will cloud up so many things just because <laughs> there's so many things in there yep. like it, it's like the potential for hundreds of new mosquitoes are in there uh, so it'll go. Out, it'll out compete everything you're saying oh my god it's so he's so he she what's the what's she, your okay she literally just came to look at me and then went back to sleep i don't know what that was about. <laughs> What, so strange what is, what is her uh what is her name her name is dolly um i didn't name her that but i don't like renaming pets so her name's just dolly she just got diagnosed with incurable allergies for the rest of her life so my sweet girl <laughs> so it's rough i was like i her neck's like patchy because she was scratching at it but she's okay we're we got her on medicine now um Good luck. Okay. They're, they're, they're like our little, uh, our fur baby. I have one here next to me. All she, Her name's Socks. She likes to sl sleep on this chair next to me all day. She gets up like oh, once an hour, snuggles me in my lap for 10 minutes, then goes right back and sleeps more. And it's like, I'm like, it's like a nice low maintenance cat. The other ones are like running around the house. I'm like, oh, I'll be like this one. This one's cool. 
Yeah, no, Dolly was very low maintenance, and then the allergies kicked in a year and a half ago, and then I'm like, okay. She usually she usually is like rocking like a inflatable cone thing. Ah. Uh. Um, but she took it off. She didn't want to wear it last night. I woke up and she had no cone on, and I was like, oh. Lovely, okay. <laughs> lovely kitty cat. Uh, she's doing okay. She's like, yeah, she's on like new drugs for the allergies, so she's doing all right. But um. Yeah, so, so yes, yes so, so I did not take any of the ovaries. Basically, like, where you can see the last little embryo on each side, I cut there. What like, do you, so, naive question again. What are you mm -hmm. using to cut? Are these, like, micro scissors? Yeah, so I, like, my, my dissection things are super, like, fine forceps. Um, and I have some scissors that are, like, I don't know if they're micro scissors, but they're pretty tiny. Mm -hmm. um, I would say I've done this enough where I like, I don't know, I'm able to kind of like grab and cut pretty easily um, and like reliably kind of consistent with those. But um, yeah, so I literally cut, cut, and then after the rest of the dissection's done, and then I put those in a tube, I sequence them. And the question I was trying to ask there is, um, with this experiment, the goal is to understand what genes are expressed in whatever you've thrown in the tube. Mm -hmm. And so my question was like, okay, great. Can I somehow pull out all of the neurons that are there? Because we have genes that are expressed only in neurons. So I'm like, let me, what about tiny laser beam to cut with? Huh. I can't tell if it's a joke, but I no, like no, no. the so, so like, That like, legit. Well, because there are, like, the tiny lasers you can do to take out, like, certain, like, clusters of cells, right? And so mm. is, is that something that you can do to, I guess, to, like, do the cuts? Or is that one of those pieces of equipment that is so pricey? It's just, like, it's just easier at that point to use the micro scissors. Yeah, I mean, I just use the scissors. Like, it, it's kind of, like... Too, that that's like too much for for that specific part mm -hmm. of it um it's like if, if your goal is just to remove the ovarian tissue you've already done that with the cuts yeah and then yeah. so and you're trying to capture the neurons right like mm -hmm. that would be innervating so when you were doing the imaging to like capture all the neurons are you satisfied with how many neurons you're getting for the dissection for the sequencing and then from chat as well smike's wondering like what kind of sequencing that you're doing yeah, this was um, RNA sequencing. Um, it did include some of our mitochondrial genes. I don't know how or why. We sent it away. It's fine. Um, anyways, uh, so I mentioned that I was doing new dissections and realized I've been rip ripping things off. Um, I did this experiment before realizing that. And so when I got my results back, like, I, I don't know, I've, the bioinformatics is the really easy part for me, like just kind of developing a pipeline and coding and getting all my transcript information. That's fine. Um, but I was getting really variable amounts of certain neural markers and I was really confused. And then looking back and seeing that I potentially was ripping certain things off at certain points, it made more sense. However, I'm okay with it because with this experiment, all I really wanted to know was like, yes is something expressed or is it not expressed and so like i had five replicates of something if in one i it like for i'm trying to think of like a neural marker just let's just go with like example neural marker um even though there was a range of expression that's still a yes to me it's expressed mm -hmm. and so what i really wanted to know is what these neurons were i didn't really necessarily care the level uh, like the abundance of this transcript um, because this was not an experiment that I was comparing. Typically with like RNA sequencing, you're taking something, I would be like, okay, here it is in the non-blood fed state. I'm also gonna do the same experiment in the blood fed state. I didn't really care about that right now. I was using this just to kind of get a list. And so, so I can still get my list. Is it almost like how you were saying all the different stains that you could do on the ovaries to figure out which ones are GABA or which ones are acetylcholine, like which, what, which is what flavor of neurons you have in there. And that's why you're looking right. for that yes, no, versus like how much they activate and like all these different nuances. 
Yeah, exactly. Nice. It was literally just like the list of like, where are, are they here? Because if they're not here, I don't even want to think about it. Like yeah. that's, it's more so just like, I have these conceptual ideas like, okay, in insect reproduction, these things are implicated. These things are implicated. Are they in my data set? Uh, I'm not seeing even like a little bit of it. I'm going to move on from that. And it's mostly to like save time and to prioritize because most of these experiments I do, like one, antibodies are extremely expensive and mosquitoes, we don't have a lot of mosquito antibodies. Um, they just have not been developed. Um, and so I don't want to waste $600 on something that may not work in a mosquito, one. Then two, the other way I typically like to do my staining is through a technique called fluorescent in situ hybridization, um, where you're basically finding all the RNA, which is usually localized to like a, like a nucleus, like basically where all those little dappy dots are, mm -hmm. like I could then use a probe for whatever sequence I want. It doesn't have to be like developed in a certain animal. Like it's just give them the sequence and the probe can kind of identify that. And so I'd be able to like that little strip of neurons, that little white part, yeah. I could basically take whatever four potential probes I think they could like that could stain that put them all in and do the staining it takes like a week I'm like really d like dwindling it it's it's long and very annoying but basically I'll put those four probes in there and then I can image that and it'll be like okay in this channel I'm seeing some of them are lighting up with this probe or some of them are lighting up with this probe but like basically that's still expensive and so I just want to be very very sure of the different genes that I want to look at uh, before like jumping in and doing a bunch of staining because it takes time it's like time <laughs> mental energy and money it's a lot yeah so that's a good point is like something that maybe is harder to consider for people is that there's all this extra stuff that goes into it like you were saying the, the well the prices of the experiments right like the, the money's not unlimited but then also the time like it's kind of wild to think that it's a week-long protocol in order to get that kind of image out right and so it's and the fact that you're developing it in a non-model organism that doesn't have the tools yet right so it's like yeah how how do you then when you're deciding to make an experiment or do an experiment given all these constraints how do you decide when it's like okay i want to do this experiment um typically if it's something that's relatively quick, I will try it. I'm just gonna try it and see what happens. Um, if it's promising, great. If not, eh, table it, maybe revisit it. Um, if it's a bigger experiment, then I talk to the big boss about it. Um, she's really good at helping, um, she's really good at big picture. And so if, if it's an experiment, she'll be like, okay, so what does this add to the big picture? And like, sometimes I need that question. Um, and so I usually work with like her, I work with other people in the lab. We are a very collaborative space because we're all trying to do really, really unique and novel things in mosquitoes. And so we really do need each other to push our work further or like, know what questions to ask, know what questions to not ask. Like we all are like running, but then at the same time we're all each other's tethers because we could just like keep going be like, let's just jump down this rabbit hole. We don't have time for that. It's, it's a hard balance, especially with how little is known on the system, right? Like you were saying of like, well, I know one of this thing and this thing, and then you can justify any of it, right? That any yeah. of any of these things could be informative for any of the other questions. And so like, why not jump down that rabbit hole? Like you're saying, well, it's like time and money and choices. And yeah, there's a bunch of like things holding us back on that front. Yeah, I'm like, I, I do, I would like to graduate at some point and like not be in a PhD program. So eventually <laughs> I have to stop. So. I, I guess that kind of picks up with the question we have from Chad is what's your end game when someone else picks up the next step from what you've done and what is your hope that will be discovered? Yeah, so I um, have difficulty with conceptualizing like what things will look like in a year and a half or like two years. I like know what I want, but I don't think it's like real. But I would say that for this project, I'd be really satisfied with having 
all of these neurons basically characterized at least by their neurotransmitter identity. Mm-hmm. Um, and I would really love some mosquito lines that like have like lost, like, I don't know. I would like modified mosquitoes that are like, they don't have any glutamate or like things like that. I would like to see, start making those connections for how these specific neurotransmitters are affecting reproductive output. Um, how I think how would so is that like for uh for Chad is that like doing CRISPR genetic engineering to removing certain yeah. properties of the neurons? Yeah, yeah that's, that's how we that's how we do it. CRISPR, you know, that is a tool we actually do have in the mosquito, which is really nice. Have you had um, a, have you had a chance to to do any CRISPR, and if so, how difficult is it? Um, I have not on my own. I helped develop one line and it was fine. The only thing that was difficult is like our PI really didn't want us to have like a fluorescent marker. So if you wanted to know you had a mutant, you had to do PCR on it, which takes a lot of time. And we have to do PCR on like 150 mosquitoes. Like it's not that fun. And, and keep it, them alive and, and on a single leg. That's oh. what I was going to ask. Yeah, so like to keep, is you have to keep them alive. Are they in isolation? You sniff a leg and then you PCR it and see if the gene is missing or not. And then you hope that that one leg injury hasn't killed it or hurt it beyond all reason so it can still keep laying and produce a line. Yeah, the, the most, like, I would say the most tedious task I've had to do is to do set up single leg mosquito PCR. Um, it's it's like we take like a bucket of ice and like a little metal dish um and like put on the ice it gets really really cold and you put the mosquito on and you have like a paintbrush you use your thumb to hold down just the last portion of the leg and a paintbrush right at like the junction and then you like you have to like slowly brush it just like gently and hope it all pops off nicely because you want the whole leg but you don't want it to traumatize the mosquito, then you have to very gently put it back into its like single enclosure um, and hope that it's alive when it wakes up. And they die. It's really annoying. We take like a specific <laughs> light. Uh, we're getting a raid in. Welcome the oh. heck in. Uh, Morgana Freya, welcome on in, Raiders. Morgana, how was your stream? Welcome in, guys. If you don't know Morgana Freya, she's an amazing maker and crafter sculptor extraordinaire morgana and raiders welcome the heck in raiders were joined today by the legendary the amazing together, scientist jedediah jedi dookie boots tall thank you for the resub Jed my friend dookie boots tall just subscribed for five months adding your resub to the beaker of raw science thank you jedi how's it going morgana how is your stream what were y'all up to uh, we have a mosquito research scientist here. The lovely Lola has joined us. She is a legend on TikTok in science communication. Together, we can rule the galaxy. Oh my goodness. Morgana as well with a resub. We got double resubs coming in. Morgana, Morgana thank you for Freya the resub. Just subscribed for 15 months. Love your face. We're right back at you, Morgana. Thank you, madame, for that resub. There is that piece of raw science. Raiders, welcome in. Morgana, we'll show off uh, your sculptures in just a bit. What were you working on today? And again, we are joined by our amazing guest today, Lola the Scientist. She is a research scientist in a mosquito genetics lab. And we're looking at a bunch of mosquito genetic samples, talking about the mosquito biology, the work that Lola's doing to change the world in terms of knowledge on the mosquitoes. And it's actually, it's quite crazy, like how little we know and how much Lola's on the front lines of mosquito genetics, and we're glad to have her here. Uh, Morgana's stream was great. It was my daughter's birthday, so we had a game playing day. We were playing Baldur's Gate 3. Very nice one, well, Morgana. Happy birthday to the, well, I'm going to say the little one, because there she's forever going to be a little one. And um, obvious question, did y'all romance the bear? That's Lola, I don't know if you know this, but in Baldur's Gate 3, you can romance a bear. Oh! That's fun. I love that. Yeah, and it's it's, I, it's the only fact I know about the game. <laughs> I've heard of this game. I like games. Oh, wait. No, I do know this game. That's fun. I've been on a Zelda kick for really long. Oh, nice. On the, the, the new Switch. Uh, Tears of the Kingdom? 
no, because I never played a Zelda game before. And so I bought Breath of the Wild. And I the second I started playing it, I was like, I fully, I get it now. I fully get it. Um, so I'm just trying, now I'm like, I've gotten so deep. I'm like, I need 100% completion. And it is not until I achieve that that I will get Tears of the Kingdom. Just so you know, Breath of the Wild is like a warm-up. Is a warm-up for Tears of the Kingdom. <laughs> like, that's what I've heard. And, uh, I su believe it. <laughs> suitable substrate, thank you for the 100 biddies. Y'all kicked off a hype train. Folks, if we do complete any levels, we will do raffles for stickers and magnets. But after Lola has left, we're going to be respectful of her time because it is approaching 9 o'clock in the evening for her. So we're going to make sure we don't keep her on for too much longer. Lola, do you have a hard out, by the way? I know we're, we start wrapping up around now. Is that okay? Yeah, that's fine. I, I have to eat dinner. I got really hungry watching everyone put in their dinner things when we first got started. I was like... <laughs> so, yeah, that's fine. Perfect. Perfect. Um, but yeah, Raiders, welcome on in. Again, with the hype train going, we'll do the raffles. If we hit any afterwards, of course, no pressure. And Morgana and Lord Jedediah, thank you for those resubs as well. Um, so we were just uh, rounding out our discussion with Lola on what would be something looking forward to as like the next potential step after the work is completed. So like, I guess on your current project, taking it along that you've identified like what neuron populations there are what is like the big end game that you would like to see? Like, what is something where you would want to see this like big difference? And Fishman, Lola, you got a gift sub. So Lola, you can now watch the stream using via ad free. Oh, that's great. I was scared the ads are gonna kick me off. I didn't know there were ads on Twitch. Oh, when you're a guest star, you don't have to, you don't see any of it. But when any, any channel you log in, that's, uh, there are ads, it's kind of like, a TV station, but now whenever you're here for the next month, you're ad free. You also get your piece of raw science in the beaker, and you also get to use all the emotes that we have. So it's like custom channel oh, emojis great. that we've made that you can use anywhere on Twitch. This is awesome. Thanks, Fishman. <laughs> this is great. And I've been feeling like I'm so overwhelmed by Twitch. I'm like, this is this is fun though. This it, is fun. It's a good. It, it could be. It could be absolute madness. People have also not been going crazy on all the redemptions, but like, there's, we have crazy things that we trigger here. Like we've got a. Uh, we do have a mosquito. Also, uh, RT lyrics. Thank you for the ten and thirteen biddies. Here's our mosquito. She's trapped in amber. Oh. Alive, alive. I love that. Say that. She comes out though, so she's safe. I love that. That's <laughs> awesome. This is great. I'm like, I feel like a kid in like a like a toy store. Uh, that's. I mean, that's that's the goal. Like you know, sci like you were saying, the importance of science communication. Like it could be really dry of a topic, and so we have a bunch of toys people can play with. And st like, here's our fruit fly character. Smikes has has brought on. Oh my God. Oh my God. Oh my God. Oh yeah, I saw this one at the beginning. I like this one. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, we get a little silly. As you should. This needs to be fun. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Because, right, you say science can get really dry, and I think it's the way we we get past that dryness and that silly. Like, you know, we have a little silly break, and then we chop back to the science, and if we need another silly break, then we do so. And if it's, you know, we even have uh, community members doing, um, do you, have you heard about Lola, the, the uwu? Yes. <laughs> yeah, so like, <laughs> people know how much I really don't enjoy the uwu, but then I have friends who like, you know, they'll, they'll do like this, <laughs> and so then That's it's hilarious. when it's goofy, then we add it into the stream and people can start triggering yeah. it. So Fishman, for example, did an uwu for us, that'll be um, added in in the not too distant future for more si more silliness and uh, shenanigansery that we'll be having in everywhere, so... <laughs> But so yeah, what would, what's that guess in wrapping up um, your next goals, and what what do we hope to see from the lovely Lola scientist in the next uh, in the next couple of years? And I guess what 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 is the plan beyond? Yeah, um, so as I was saying, I would love the reproductive system to be mapped, like the, the nervous system of the reproductive tract to be mapped. Um, and I would love to find like what we were saying earlier, like a point to break it. I would love to break it, or at least at least have a point where someone could then break it. Um, I'm okay with not doing it myself. I think mapping out the system would be a contribution to the field because 
we don't have this information out there. And it's like a whole rabbit hole of experiments just waiting to happen. Um, and so I feel pretty good about that. Um, I would say a after all of this, what am I doing with my life? Um, I don't know. I, I love science communication and that's really the path I want to take. Uh, I'm not sure what type of career I want for that. Um, I don't know. I think I'm really interested in like having a space for scientists to come and chat or like talk about crazy experiments. I was thinking about doing that for like a podcast or something like talking about kind of breaking down some of our more unknown, but really wacky experiments um, and having a space to kind of discuss ethics. What does science look like without it? What does it look like with it? Um, yeah, and I'll just be making my TikToks and eventually I'm going to graduate and then I'll be, I'll be Dr. Lola um, and then I'll move on to something else. I'm not sure. I think I would like to stay in the lab for a little bit, but also have like an intentional science communication component of whatever I do after this. Uh, but I'm not sure. It's all up in the air. I'm like, I just turned 25. So I'm like, I don't, there's, I feel like there's so much life to live. Who knows? <laughs> that's, that's beautiful. Um, is there any parting thought that you'd like to leave us with? I know when you started off the stream, you mentioned the importance of science communication and just like, really the beauty behind all that you're doing is there anything that you'd like to you know leave leave the viewers with yeah i would say that like the biggest thing it doesn't i mean doesn't matter what it's about but just staying curious and asking questions is going to continue to give your life purpose i feel like we have such a privilege to be able to wake up and look at something and question why it is the way it is and we can use it's those questions that change the world. It doesn't have to be just science, but in whatever it is that we're doing. And so for me, I found a lot of empowerment in asking questions about bugs and mosquitoes and this deadly annoying creature that everyone really thinks is gross and even I think is gross. But there's so much beauty hidden in those questions, but having the guts to ask those questions are really gonna get you closer to those answers. That's what I have to say. I love it. Well, Lola, thank you so very much uh, for hanging with us today and answering our questions and telling us all about mosquitoes. Um, guys, make sure to go follow Lola on her TikTok page. We'll link that again in the chat and uh, anywhere else that you'd like to promote. Wait, go follow her on Twitch, too. You never know. She might hit that go live button and she'll be on here, too. Maybe. We'll see. Um, yeah, my Instagram's the same. All three of my usernames are the same. So, like, you could just find me at any of those places. Don't follow me on Twitter. If you find me on Twitter, don't follow me there. There's nothing <laughs> happening there. I don't, I don't. I don't do anything there. Um, but yeah, I don't know. Maybe one day. Maybe one day I'll. I'll go live on Twitch. This is pretty fun. Um, and thank you all for listening. And I'd love to be able to answer more questions in whatever capacity works for y'all. So find me on social media, and I'm down to discuss more. Awesome. Well, thank you so very much, Lola. Have a great evening and. Uh... Thank I'm you. sure we'll be asking you to come back in the, in the future. So thank you very much again. There's always something new, so I'm always ready. <laughs> Appreciate you. Have a good night. Thanks. You too. Bye, Bye. everyone. All right, y'all. That was the lovely Lola the Scientist. Uh, big thank you to her for joining us today. That was a lot of fun, y'all. Very different. I know it's still microscopy. We're looking at really pretty images. Uh, but it was really exciting to chat with her and learn about some really unique biology that's being done and the importance of mosquito genetics.